Sean bienvenidas y bienvenidos al segundo día del Congreso Internacional EDO 2012, en el cual vamos a empezar la jornada con la segunda conferencia programada y contamos con el placer de que esta conferencia sea impartida por el señor David Gertin. El señor David Gertin, tal como desea él mismo presentarse cuando introduce algunas notas biográficas en sus distintas y numerosas publicaciones digitales, básicamente, se describe como una persona que ha estado trabajando 30 años en la industria de la alta tecnología. Actualmente es un formador y coach en el ámbito del conocimiento, de la gestión del conocimiento, básicamente para ayudar a personas en las organizaciones a que compartan su conocimiento de una manera más libre, a que sean más creativas, a que sean más innovadoras y que sepan trabajar de una forma más eficaz. El señor Gartin es el fundador de la Gartin Knowledge Community, una red de aprendizaje global que reúne alrededor de 17.000 personas, no es poco, en unos 160 países. Se trata, sin duda, de una comunidad importante en la cual las personas que se adhieren tienen el compromiso de marcar la diferencia. La diferencia por el deseo en aprender y en compartir, la diferencia en el momento de intentar ver el mundo de una forma diferente, la diferencia a la hora de intentar generar alternativas. Se trata de una red con una serie de publicaciones regulares, una carta mensual que ya va por su séptimo año y también que dispone de una página web de recursos a disposición de sus miembros en la cual se pueden encontrar artículos de revistas, de libros, perfiles, calendarios de actividades y otros elementos vinculados con la gestión del conocimiento y las comunidades de aprendizaje. El señor Gartin se define a sí mismo también como conferenciante y como facilitador, una persona que se acerca a las organizaciones, a las personas que las forman y desde esta perspectiva gestionan el conocimiento y el aprendizaje. Es muy conocido por una actividad que desarrolla en la ciudad de Londres y en otras capitales del mundo, denominada los Knowledge Café, los cafés del conocimiento, espacios donde las personas pueden reunirse y compartir sus inquietudes y preguntas con relación a estas cuestiones. De todos modos, el señor Gartin, para llegar a este recorrido y a esta calidad y prestigio en el ámbito de la gestión del conocimiento, entre otras cosas, él mismo dice que es debido a su trayectoria de implicación en corporaciones internacionales vinculadas con el desarrollo de software. En concreto, una de las experiencias que él considera que más le ha marcado y que ha resultado significativa en su carrera es su vinculación durante el, el fin de la década de los 80 a Lotus Development, donde actuó con un rol en el cual tuvo la ocasión de desarrollar un importante aprendizaje que le ha sido útil para el resto de su carrera. Con relación a la conferencia, ahora da, vamos a dar paso, vamos a dar la palabra al señor Gartin para que nos enriquezca con sus aportaciones y él mismo se encargará de introducir de qué manera nos pretende ayudar a compartir conocimiento y a reflexionar sobre la temática que nos va a presentar. Sin más, le paso la palabra al señor Gartin. Okay. Gracias. Uh, buenos días. Good morning. It's interesting hearing the description of who I am and what I do, um, because increasingly um, I find myself doing one thing, 
when people ask me what I do, rather than sort of reading out uh, something maybe quite as lengthy as that, I often say to people, I travel the world having interesting conversations with people. Or maybe more accurately, I travel the world bringing people together to have interesting conversations themselves. And uh, sometimes that generates more conversations, sometimes it kills the conversation stone dead because people can't quite relate to that and they can't fig quite figure out maybe how I make a living um, having conversations. But um, in the spirit of having conversations, what I'd like to do to start this talk is something just a little bit different. Um, I'd like you to simply turn to your neighbor, somebody who you don't know, preferably, so you can turn to your left or your right or turn behind you, and just, I'll just give you two minutes to have a conversation with them, to say good morning, to say hello, to introduce yourself. Um, and we'll do that just twice, so you just have two conversations, hopefully with two people who you haven't got to speak with yet. And then we'll move on into the presentation. Okay? So pretty simple. So over to you for some conversation. Yes. I'm I'm a professor. Professor. It's I'm a you <laughs> and I'm David Gertine, and, and I go around the world having interesting conversations. <laughs> But I'm, I'm... You. Okay, could I, could I have your attention? Could you now swap partners? Could you now have a conversation with somebody different?
Okay, shall we, shall we pause and uh, come back to the presentation? <clears throat> okay, so I hope you enjoyed your conversation. Let me, let me move on. Has it struck any of you that it's a little bit of a paradox that this conference is fundamentally about informal learning? But here we are sitting in a formal, traditional lecture theatre, and you have speakers at the front here talking at you in that traditional way. Now, I don't mean this as a criticism of the organisers, or of the speakers, or of yourselves. I was speculating about it this morning. I'm thinking, how many lectures like this are taking place all over the world right now? How many people are being lectured at? It must be millions, hundreds of millions. If you include schools, you include universities, it's got to be a very large number. But is it the most effective way of teaching? Is it the most effective way of learning? I'm sure you've all got your own opinions on that. Um, I've discovered a, um, a Scottish gentleman called Donald Clark, who talks a lot about this at various conferences. And um, one of the things he said that had me in fits of laughter when I read it, he said, show me a professor of pedagogy who still lectures his students and I'll show you a hypocrite who hasn't read the research. Now I haven't read the research to be honest with you but uh, I gather pretty much all the research does demonstrate that the lecture style of teaching is not terribly effective. If I go back 10 years, 12 years, to about the year 2000, that was when I first started to actually question this lecture style of, uh, of teaching, if you will. I used to go up to London to listen to some knowledge management talks that were organized by the City University Business School. And these were the sorts of talks that you might get in a large city in the evening. They were free, and they lasted for maybe up to an hour, maybe 30 to 40 minutes for the presentation, maybe 10 minutes or so for questions and answers. And then in true British tradition, we would carry on down the pub. We'd go down the pub to, to, finish, the, to finish the evening. Now, many of those talks were good, but I would reckon maybe six out of 10 were best described as dire. They were quite literally death by PowerPoint. I've still never figured out why a speaker, it's why I have no slides. Um, I can never quite figure out why a speaker who knows they've only got 30 minutes to speak would quite literally have 178 PowerPoint slides. I'm sure on several occasions there were at least that number, maybe. Maybe a few less. I, I could be exaggerating. And it just seemed a crazy way of teaching because when they had that large number of slides, they overran their time. On at least one occasion, the cleaners came in and were starting to clean the room. And there was no time for questions, no time for interaction, no real time for reflection. And on those evenings, what do you think was the best part of the evening? <laughs> the pub, of course. <laughs> now, it wasn't just the, the alcohol and you know, the, the socialization, although that was part of it. it was, to my mind, it was the conversations we were having down the pub, because we know we, if we couldn't ask the questions of the speaker during the session, if the speaker had come down the pub, and often they didn't, 
you could ask them questions at the pub, but you could have a conversation around the topic. You could say, you know, what did you think of that particular idea? You know, I'm not too sure I agreed with that. And there would be some, some great interaction um, down the pub. And it seemed to me that here I was in this sort of new field of knowledge management, to some degree in formal learning, and I just felt we weren't walking the talk. This just seemed crazy that we were doing this. And so I wanted to do something a little bit different. I wanted to run talks in London where the speaker only spoke for maybe five or ten minutes, maybe a little bit longer. And then we would go into some sort of conversation mode. Um, and my idea was always you know, to, to kind of model it on the sort of pub conversations that uh, uh, you know, we might have. So that was, for me, the birth of the Knowledge Cafe. I started run, running them in London in September 2002. So I've got to figure out some sort of birthday party, some sort of conversational birthday party to have in, have in September. I haven't uh, quite uh, figured that out yet. So that was how the, that was how the cafe started. And I'm going to come back to, back to them and explain a little bit more about the process a little bit later. But there were other things going on at about that time. I was starting to, you know, to read books, various books um, on knowledge management, and various books I came across you know, on conversation. And one book I came across, again about the year 2000, was a book called The Clue Train Manifesto. How many, of, how many of you have actually read that book or seen that book? Just, just, just a couple. Maybe it didn't make it to Spain. I'm not too sure. In the book, it was fundamentally looking at really the coming of Web 2.0, of the collaborative web, of the social web. And the authors pretty much predicted what was coming. And they were saying basically to corporate marketeers, hey guys, you've got to wake up. Your customers, your consumers, they are now going to be able to have conversations amongst themselves mediated by the web. And you are going to have to be part of that conversation. So the book was fundamentally about conversation, but electronically mediated conversation, not face-to-face -face conversation. But there was a lot of interesting things in there. One of the authors, David Weinberger, very early on in the book, said this. He said, as knowledge workers, our job, our sole job, was to have interesting conversations. How many of you have ever thought or said to a friend when they've asked you what you do, you say, well, my job is to have interesting conversations. I never thought of it that way. Um, I probably still, actually, maybe I do in, you know, in my particular case. But, you know, you could argue whether that's true or not. But the real issue is that conversation is central to our work as knowledge workers. It's a major part of what we do. We couldn't do our job without engaging in conversation. So it just got me thinking more about the importance of conversation in our working lives. Now, I then came across another little teeny weeny book that I often carry with me. It's a lovely little book, simply entitled Conversation. And it's written by an Oxford historian called Theodore Zeldin. And Theodore Zeldin is in his, uh, in his 70s. He looks a tad like Albert Einstein. He's got this great big mass of white, fluffy hair. I've met him a few times. He's actually, actually a little crazy. That's fine. It's, it's, it's bad crazy and there's good crazy. Theodore's good, good crazy. I say he's crazy. He does things like hold conversation dinners where he brings people together and he pairs them off with a complete stranger. And they sit and they have dinner together. Now, you've not only got a food menu where you select your starter and your main course, and your dessert. But for each of those choices, you've also got a conversation menu. 
you can choose what you're going to discuss over your starter. You can choose what you're going to discuss over your main course and your dessert. And they're deep questions. They're questions like, what would you like to see engraved on your tombstone? Have you ever thought about that? Never mind discussed it with somebody. Um, you know, what's the biggest um, lesson that you've learned in your life so far? What legacy would you like to leave to the world? You know, they, are, they are personal questions. And uh, I've taken part in two of those dinners now. And they are really quite interesting and quite moving. You, you get to know a complete stranger in a way that uh, you wouldn't normally do in any other setting. But Theodore, in the book, very early on, says this about conversation. Let's see if I can remember the words. He says, the conversation is a meeting of minds with different memories and habits. And that when two minds meet, they don't just exchange facts. They transform them. They reshape them. They draw different implications from them. And they engage in new trains of thought. Conversation doesn't just shuffle the cards. Conversation creates new cards. I don't know how that translates into Spanish, but in English, I like his use of language. He's saying that conversation is fundamentally creative. Each one of you now is hearing something different. It's not as if there's some binary stream of digits flowing from my head to Miguel's head with some sort of error correcting protocol to make sure that he receives it exactly as I meant it. It doesn't work like that, does it? You're all hearing something different. You're all making something different of what I'm saying. In Theodore's words, you're taking what I'm saying, you're reshaping it, you're transforming it, and you're engaging in new trains of thought, often totally different trains of thought, nothing to do with what I'm talking about. That's the nature of conversation, and that kind of gets at the heart of what conversation, to my mind, is all about. So you can imagine at the time I was thinking about the cafe, thinking about conversation, starting to read these books and saying, aha, maybe there's something here. Maybe there's a little bit more to conversation than I'd ever realized. And then, coming back to the first book, The Clue Train Manifesto. Again, I said there were several authors um, who contributed to the book. But David Weinberger said this in the book. Again, this had, me, this had me laughing. He said, for all our knowledge, we have no idea what we're talking about. And he then went on to say that the problem, the issue with knowledge management was not that we needed to know more. Knowledge management shouldn't be about shoveling more and more information at us. It should be helping us to understand better. And that, to me, just seemed a, a, a very sort of deep, meaningful insight. Because for the last 15, 20 years, we've had the World Wide Web. We've had Google, we've had Wikipedia. We've had you know, this incredible access to the world's knowledge or information. And are we that much better off for it? Are we more productive? Are we more efficient? Are we more effective? Are we more capable? Are we making better decisions? Are we solving all the world's problems? You could argue that <laughs> we're drowning, that we're drowning in the stuff and that it's actually making things worse. The real issue is understanding it better so we can make better decisions and in turn act more appropriately. 
And what David Weinberger then goes on to say, as human beings, how do we best understand the world? He didn't say through, through giving lectures. That was one thing he didn't say. <laughs> what he said was that we do it through storytelling. That's the natural way the human beings have shared their knowledge you know, through our evolutionary history. We haven't got to go back very far before computers, before the printing press, before stone tablets and clay tablets, you know, to the days when our knowledge was passed down through conversation, through the telling of stories, of anecdotes. It's the way the Australian Aborigines passed down their knowledge, their laws, their culture, for they reckon as long as 50,000 years, which is quite amazing. So again, this was all feeding into my thinking about the cafe and the importance of conversation. And then Theodore said something else in his little book when he talked about conversation. He said the kind of conversation that he liked was a conversation where we're prepared to emerge a slightly different person. A conversation where we're prepared to change as a person. So he was talking about a learning conversation. He was talking about something that I quickly discovered was referred to as dialogue. A lot of you probably know far more about dialogue than I do, but at the time, this was my introduction to it and to the work of physicists like David Bohm and a lot of other people who have taken a lot of time to think and write about learning conversations. And I often give this talk with slides and I've got a little list of some of the principles behind dialogue. And I normally just pull out two of those um, principles and uh, talk about them. Let's just pull up one of them for now. And I think this is, this is the key to dialogue. What it says is that when you're having a conversation with somebody and they have a different opinion to you, and especially if it's a topic that you kind of very emotionally attach to, it's far too easy to get in to debate, where you're trying to make your point of view, they're trying to make theirs. No one is listening to each other. It's an intellectual battle. I've heard debate referred to as being a blood sport. And of course, debate also very quickly can um, fall into argument. So what he says, you know, when somebody has a different opinion to you, this is the time to be curious. This is the time to learn. You know, whatever it is they've got to say, you know, if, if, you, if you respect them, and I think we should probably be respecting everybody, here's your opportunity to say, well, that's interesting, that's curious. I see the world a little differently. Would you like to explain why you see it that way? And take the time to listen rather than to attack. You know, I could probably have a conversation with one of you here about a topic that we differ on. When you think that maybe, let's say I, I had a conversation with a young woman here in the audience, there's a difference in our ages, probably a big difference in our ages. There's a difference in our culture. There's a difference in our language. There's a difference in our educational system. There's a difference in our religion. We are so different, all of us. It's not too surprising that we see the world differently when it comes to complex issues. And isn't that a great opportunity to have some great conversation and learn from each other? It doesn't mean that you've got to roll over and accept the other person's point of view. It's perfectly okay to, to listen, to have that conversation and say, okay, now I understand a little better. I still disagree, but it's looking for that understanding. It's not looking for winning the argument. And this was the sort of conversation I wanted to have in my knowledge cafes. 
I didn't want the cafes to be about debate and arguments. I wanted them to be about learning conversations. So this is going back um, 10 years, 12 years. And uh, that kind of led into the first knowledge cafe that I ran in London. Now let me do something yet again. Let me pause there, because I've, I've spoken long enough. I often feel that as a, as a speaker, we should never speak for more than about 20 minutes at the front of the room here before engaging in some way. So I, I want to get, get you to do something now. Again, just for a few minutes like before. Um, what I'd like you to do is just turn to each other in twos and threes, maybe fours. If you want to stand up at the end to kind of come together, just do that. I'm only going to give you a few minutes, maybe three or four minutes. And I'd like you to have a conversation around what I've just said, around the importance of dialogue, around the importance of conversation as a, uh, as a creative um, uh, engagement, even going back to what I was saying earlier about the uh, concept of the lecture and how effective that is compared to maybe other, other forms of learning. So just, just have that conversation amongst yourselves just, just for a few minutes, okay? Conversation time over. <laughs> For now. Okay, let's, um, sorry. Let me continue now with the presentation. I always, I know, <laughs> I always hate stopping the conversation. I always give it time to wind down because people have things that they're in the middle of, stories that they're in the middle of telling. You, know, you feel the need to, to finish the story. What I'm going to do now is three things. I want to tell you a little bit more about how I've seen the cafes used. Um, I'll then come and explain the process in a lot more detail. And then we're going to, as best we can in this, uh, in this room, sort of do a little sort of taster of the cafe. Now, I started to run the cafes in London, as I said, 10 years ago. And they were really just a replacement for, uh, or an alternative for you know, standard presentations. And that was fine. I used to run them regularly in London. And I travel around the world as a speaker to various conferences. I would run them 
at uh, different conferences around the world. And one of the things I first learned with the cafe is that if you bring people together in a safe environment where they're not put on the spot, they're not forced to do things they don't want to do, but they feel safe, whatever the culture, people will engage in conversation. Even, even in Asian cultures where I was told it would never work. There are some cultural issues, but if you make it safe, if you take into account the culture and the people, the, ca the cafes work well. So I was running them in a public setting, a little bit like this. And then, <clears throat> at one point, probably about a year after I'd first started to run the cafes, I ran a knowledge cafe for internally within an organization in Zurich. And because I was working in the field of knowledge management, one of the questions I used to pose to people was this. I'd say, you know, what are the barriers to knowledge sharing? And how do you think you could overcome them? And because I was doing this inside the company, I just changed the question slightly. I said to them, what are the barriers to knowledge sharing in your organization? And how do you think you could overcome them? Now, normally in a knowledge cafe, I don't try to capture anything, because it's simply replacing uh, a presentation. It, you know, it wasn't a workshop. We'd got just a minute or two into the conversation, and one of the young women managers stood up and said, David, we can't go on like this. We've got to stop. And I was a little bit shocked. I thought something was terribly wrong. <laughs> and she said, no, 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 no. We've got to capture what's going on. And what I hadn't realized in the room, there were three different departments. And this was the first time they'd ever really talked to each other. And they were discovering all sorts of problems and issues that they had that nobody was aware of, not even senior management. People working for the same customer and not being aware of it. Projects for different customers that were essentially delivering the same output that sh should have been combined or shared in some way, but they didn't know. I mean, the communication in the organization was, was really bad. And I had just, in some ways, maybe not solved it, but at least <laughs> surfaced the issue, but just by bringing them together to have a conversation. And again, that was sort of part of my early learning. That was an, an, an aha moment. Hey, the cafes can be used for other things. Conversation is, is not just necessarily about sharing tacit knowledge. It's about surfacing problems and issues. And then, about a year later, I ran my first little knowledge cafe workshop. Um, again, at a conference where I taught people how to run the cafes. And there was a woman there from Statoil in Norway. Three months later, I went out to Stavanger in Norway, and I trained several people in this, sort of no in this knowledge cafe process. And I've been out there probably three or four times since and trained a lot more people. And what I saw now was Statoil taking the cafe format, taking this sort of conversational style of learning and applying it in a whole load of different ways that I had never thought of. At the time, they um, were going through a merger, um, Statoil and a company called Hydro. So they used the knowledge cafes to bring the senior executives together simply to have conversations around the future of the organization, not necessarily to make decisions, but again, to get that understanding, to start to build relationships. They also did it you know, with the senior technology people, you know, the experts in the organization, to start to share a lot of the technical expertise, because you know, most of that technical expertise wasn't written down 
in documents or databases. It was in people's heads. What else did they do? Um, one of the interesting things they do, and I'll come back to this in a moment, they started to use it uh, to change their, ma their, their internal management training. And to, again, to get away from the lecture style format of training. They, used, they would bring senior managers, senior managers and junior managers together to have conversations around topics to actually transfer the knowledge and the learning uh, that way. Um, I've forgotten them all now. There's several different ways they took the cafe and started to apply it. Also, I was discovering in London that um, several people who would come to my cafes in London were taking the cafe back to their organizations and adapting it you know, for very specific business purposes. And I think one of the best examples I have of the application of the cafe was one I discovered last year. And this is ING Bank in Amsterdam. They had a small knowledge management team. Like many organizations, what this team was doing was it's like sort of a competitive intelligence unit, if you will. They looked out into the broader world to monitor what was going on you know, at large in the banking industry, in, in the financial world, what new regulation there was, what new scandals there were, what new competitive products there were. And they were distributing um, reports you know, by email to people in the organization who had subscribed to them. I mean, that's often thought of as being knowledge management, getting the information to the people, pushing the information to people who needed it. And often organizations, that's as far as they go. But what they did, they, what, they went one stage further. They had actually learned about my cafes from a, um, <laughs> they learned about my cafes from a cafe I'd done in, Barcel in Barcelona, here in Barcelona at a university here, um, three or four years ago. And um, so what they did, not only did they send out the information, when there was a particular hot issue that they felt was maybe a major risk to the organization or major opportunity to the organization or something that was really not clear that they needed to, to better understand, they would convene a knowledge cafe. They'd bring people together, having read the report or watched a video, to have a conversation around the topic to better understand it. And at least initially, not necessarily to actually make decisions, just to get their heads around it and better understand what was going on. And, and, and to me, that's just a wonderful um, application of the cafe and sort of some of the principles I've been talking about. You know, the, the, the first part is, is that push, going back to David Weinberger saying, we don't need more knowledge, we need better understanding. They're doing both. They're, they're pushing the information out to people and then using you know, IT, and then they're using conversation to get that better understanding and to make decisions as to how they're going to move forward. So again, an, another example of how I've seen the cafe uh, actually used. So let me, let me pause there for a moment and Step on. I've been talking about this knowledge cafe thing without actually explaining it. So let me, let me explain the process. At, at one level, it's a very simple process. Not too difficult to remember the order of things to do. But there are some subtleties to it that I want to talk about that I actually think are very, are very important. When I first started to run the cafes 10 years or so ago, I would invite a speaker to speak at my cafe because you know, essentially it was a, an adaption of a presentation. And the speaker would say, well, fine, David, you know, but what do I need to do? And I'd say, well, there's two key things I want you to do. First of all, I want you to speak without any PowerPoint slides. 
and their faces would drop. <laughs> Some of them would look terrified at the thought of not having their slides to depend on. And I'd say, well, don't worry. You know, that's, that's the bad news. The good news is I only want you to speak for five minutes on a topic of interest to you and the audience. And then I want you to pose a question to the group. Now, in reality, I was lying to them because I don't mind a few PowerPoint slides. I often use them myself. I just don't want 178 of them. So four or five slides, maybe even 10 slides, is fine. Also, I don't know a speaker on this planet who can only speak for five minutes. If they say five, they will take 15. Pretty much guaranteed. Sometimes, if you don't stop them, I've got a feeling they would go on forever. Stop me if I go over. <laughs> Just trying to get the message across that you know, this isn't about them presenting loads of slides. This is them really about seeding an idea in the group and being the sort of initiator for the conversation. And let's say at that stage, I will take over and I will facilitate the Knowledge Cafe. So they give their short talk. See, one of the things I like, probably most of you have seen these, and that's the TED Talks. One of the things to note about TED is those TED Talks are usually no longer than 20 minutes long, 15 to 20 minutes. And I just got a feeling that that's sort of almost the optimum time for presenting anything before you know, people start to go to sleep. So the speaker gives the talk. The speaker poses the question. The cafe works best, I've discovered, where I've got maybe 20 to 30 people sitting in a room with small tables. It works best with small um, you know, cafe-style tables about three feet in diameter, four people per table. I can do it with any size table. I can do it with more people or less people. Four seems to be optimum. Three is too few, because often one person can get cut out of the conversation, or the conversation can even potentially dry up. Six, seven, or eight people, people get, can get totally cut out of the conversation. It's a few too many. It'll still work, but it just doesn't work so well. I've got a rule of thumb uh, for the cafe, and I, I say this, is that you know, the best conversations are when you're close enough to actually touch somebody. I'm saying, not that I want you to touch people, but you know, it's when you're that close, you, know, you can lean in, you, know, you, you really get engaged in the conversation. When you're six feet away, the conversation isn't quite, isn't quite the same. So people have the conversation at their tables. I typically give people about 10 to 15 minutes, depending on how much time I've got. I then simply say, could a few, t could a few people move tables? And I'm not more prescriptive than that. Because I know some people are quite happy in their groups and they don't want to move. And there are others, for whatever reason, they want to move. They're more gregarious. Or maybe somebody's boring them, to be honest at the table. I'm trying not to control people. I'm trying to make it very safe, very comfortable for people by not being too controlling. So they move, and they continue the conversation with the same question. And I do that three times. So we have three rounds of conversation. Now, in the early days, I would then bring people back together at the end and have a whole group conversation. But I discovered quite quickly, if the group was kind of quite large, maybe 30 people, with lots of little tables in the room, or even larger tables in the room, it was very difficult to have that whole group conversation. Because what I didn't want them to do was to report back to me. I wanted them to sort of have a, a conversation in the room. And very early on, I discovered something that I think facilitators, you know, professional facilitators, have known for a long time, is the magic of a circle. 
And what amazes me that even with 30, 40, even 50 people, if I tell them just push the tables to one side and form a circle with the chairs, it takes less than two minutes to do that. And I've got photographs on my website of circles as, as many as 50. And what's interesting, even at, even at that size, well, well, the first thing about the circle is everyone can see each other, everyone can hear each other, even at that size. Everyone is equal, there's no hierarchy in the circle. But the circle, I say I stumbled across it by accident almost, is almost a little bit of magic. It just works so well. So we sit in the circle, and I say to people, so who would like to continue the conversation? And I do that quite deliberately. And it's quite interesting because different cultures react differently. Um, in a cafe I went in India recently, everybody, but pretty much everybody, started talking at once, <laughs> right across each other. In Asian countries, say Singapore, deathly silence, not a word. And even in the UK sometimes, nobody wants to start the conversation in the larger group because you know, there's clearly some risk to that. But I'm never the first one to break. It's one of my golden rules. I'm never going to be the first one to talk, I say. So who would like to continue the conversation? And then, and then I shut up. And I sit and I wait. Sometimes it seems like forever. But there's always somebody in the room who's more embarrassed by the silence than I am. <laughs> and somebody starts. And I do that quite deliberately to demonstrate that I am not going to control the conversation or go into expert mode and start talking at them again. This is their, this is their conversation. The other thing I do, and this was a, a late adaption to the cafe as well, because normally I would finish there. This, this is replacing a presentation, so I'm not looking to capture things on flip charts or paper. You know, at that point, normally, you know, we would, we would finish the evening. But I, I never kind of came away sort of having a feel for maybe what everybody thought. It wasn't that I was looking for consensus, but I know personally I wanted to have some feel for what people were taking away from the evening. And I knew that others did as well. So now what I do, if I've got the time, is, and the circle's small enough, I'll go round the circle and ask each person in turn just to share one insight, something that they've learned, something that they're going to do as a result of the cafe, as a result of the conversation. And that's often quite amazing what people are taking away. Sometimes there's some very obvious things they're taking away and things in common. Sometimes people are taking things away, taking ideas away that I kind of wonder whether they've actually been in the room because it's, there's something completely different. And again, going back to Theodore Zeldin's piece about triggering new trains of thought, they've been triggered down some totally different path by the conversation during the evening. And so that's a nice way of actually finishing the cafe is sharing those items. Now let me just go back and say a few things about the cafe that I think are important. Often when you're doing workshops, people um, appoint a leader at, at a table. And that person is maybe going to take notes, maybe that person is going to stand up and report back um, later. And the problem with that, I find, sort of in a cafe setting, is that, uh, first of all, usually the most dominant person in the group self-appoints himself. And now they, not always, but they tend to dominate the conversation. And the others in the group tend to give way to them because they're the leader. They're in control. That's what you do. That's what we've been taught to do. And so it totally distorts the conversation. One of the principles of my cafe is that everyone is equal and I don't want to do anything in the room to um, infer any sort of hierarchy. So there are no table leaders. I even say to people at times, 
it's okay to come along and just listen. I've had a few people phone me up before a cafe and say, Dave, I'm quite shy, I'm quite reserved, I'd like to come along, but, but I don't want to say anything. And I say, that's okay, you don't need to. In reality, put them at a small table in a small group, make it safe, they'll engage. That's, 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 that's hardly ever a problem. So, no table leaders, everyone's equal, and no reporting back. The only time I get close to putting anybody on the spot is when I go around the circle at the end. And even then, I say to people, if you don't have anything to share, if you don't want to share anything, it's perfectly okay to say pass. And what's interesting, often the most vociferous people in the room who've been, been the most engaged are the people who pass. They actually feel they've already said enough. <laughs> and I rather like it when they do that because they're demonstrating there's nothing negative um, you know, or, or to be ashamed of by not actually saying something uh, when I go around the circle at the end. I've, I've probably missed one or two, one or two subtleties, but you know, fundamentally what I'm trying to do in that cafe is just make it a very, very safe place for conversation. One of the other things I say is it's perfectly okay to go off topic. I'm sure you're very familiar again with corporate workshops, again, typically where you've got a leader at the table and they're focused. You, know, that you, you need some sort of outcome. You, you need to you know, focus on the question, focus on the, on the conversation. And so if you start to go off topic, they will pull you back on and say, David, you know, you're going off topic. Be quiet. You know, let's get back to the, let's get back to the subject in hand. The problem is, is, is then David then withdraws into himself because he's been slapped down as a naughty boy for you know, going off topic. When we have natural conversations, we go off topic all the time. But if it's something that's important to us, we'll go off, maybe for a few minutes, and come back. That's the nature of conversation. It's actually a good thing. It gives people the time to reflect Often, when someone goes off on a tangent, it makes a new connection that otherwise wouldn't have been made. Yeah? So that's the essence. I'm just looking at the time. So we're quarter to 11, so I've got about 30 minutes left. What I'd like to do now is sort of run a little cafe, but it's, it's as you can gather, it's, but if we could just push, push, push these chairs away and we could bring in some tables, then maybe we could do it. But I, I, I don't think we're going to get to do that. <laughs> so what we're, going to, what we're going to do is a little bit like before. I'm, I'm going to give you a question in the moment. Um, what I'd like you then to do is, like you did before, just turn to each other in twos and threes and fours, stand up if you will, um, and have a conversation around that topic. Um, I might just do it the once or the twice. I mean, normally I'd do it three times and give you ten minutes, but what I want to do is just give you a little bit of a flavor of the conversation and then come back and you can share some of your thoughts from the conversation, but you can then also get to ask me a whole load of difficult questions, I hope. I, I enjoy difficult questions. So, right. So I think, think maybe we'll just, we'll just do the one round. We, we, we won't actually change. We, we'll just do the one round to allow more time for the, for the group questions. So my question to you is this. You've heard everything I've had to say. Now, what do you think the role of conversation is in business? What's, what's the role? Is it important? Or am I just full of hot air? Am I just making a lot of fuss about nothing? So is it important? Why is it important? Maybe even how can we encourage more conversation in our organizations? Pick up on what you feel passionate about and uh, have, a little, have a little conversation around that for about 10 minutes, OK? Over to you.
Well, once again, the most difficult bit. Right, okay, good. Bien. So, you know, that wasn't quite a cafe. We didn't do any, any changes. You just got to have a little bit of conversation. Let me just say something that I didn't say earlier. Um, one of the things I'd love to see more of, both at conferences you know, and in internal talks within organizations, you know, typically, you know, you know, even within organizations, we get a lot of talks you know, and a lot of PowerPoint presentations. And the format is typically, you know, if there's 40 minutes, it's 30 minutes presentation with slides, 10 minutes for Q&A. And typically what happens is that people run over and there's five minutes for Q&A well, there's no time for Q&A because they've run out of time. Um, what I like to do when I'm giving talks, and I also do it when I'm chairing conferences, is to say to the speakers, you've got 40 minutes. I only want you to present for 20 minutes. So you present for 20, and then turn the room over to conversation, like I just did. So, OK, now have a conversation around what I've just presented. Or maybe even pose a question that the audience or the participants have a conversation around. And then go into Q&A. So now it's 20 minutes presentation, 10 minutes conversation, 10 minutes Q&A. And one of the great things about that, especially if you're chairing a conference, is if the speaker does run over, if they run over five minutes, you've still got a full 15 minutes left for conversation and Q&A. They can run over by 10 minutes, and you've still got 10 minutes left. So it works really, really well. It's just, just inserting that little piece of conversation between the presentation and the Q&A. And everybody, everybody can do that. But anyway, um, what I'd like to do now, we've got about 10, 15 minutes. Clearly, if you want to ask me a question, that's fine. But if you just want to share an insight, Share a thought with the room. It could be your own thought or something that you discussed in your groups with the rest of the room. You just want to get up and share something rather than ask me a question. That's fine. We can't really have a conversation across the room here. It's a little bit difficult. We've only got two roving mics. Um, if somebody says something and you want to respond, that's fine as well. So this isn't just about asking me questions or reporting back to me. You know, to the degree we can, just make it a little bit more informal. So, um, who would uh, who would like to start? Thank you. Microphone. Microphone. Hello, everybody. Uh, in English or in Spanish? Or in, well, in English, is. maybe, well. English is. Or, I'm going to talk about it in Catalan, if you don't know. Okay, or in Catalan, or in Finnish, okay. I'm, okay, I'm a Finn, but I live here. And, um, well, I, I w I've been working as a teacher, and at the moment I work at the university. Well, also as a teacher, but I'm doing research. And, well, what comes to education, we are doing learning cafes, dynamizing workshops all the time. We are not lecturing a lot anymore. And uh, I'm a bit, personally, I'm a bit worried that young, young generations, they are not able to enjoy lectures anymore. They don't know how to listen, how to be in silence, how to reflect. Because okay. it's all about talking and conversation and a different kind of missing. So I think when we, we as a teacher, we also should teach them how to be quiet and listen okay. and reflect. What do you think about it? Just a reflection. I mean, I suspect you're right. I suspect it's, it's all about balance. I mean, I'm certainly not advocating that we get totally rid of lectures and, and, and talking and, and listening, um, because we do need to do that to impart information. Um, but no, I sit and, sit and look at my education and my generation, and w we didn't sit around at the school and have conversations. We, w we were talked at, you know, pretty much uh, solidly. So it's good to hear that it's changing, but you're right. It doesn't need. It shouldn't go. 
if it shouldn't flip totally the other way. Sometimes it happens with us as we get so excited about some new things that we forget the old good things that mm -hmm. we should also yeah, use. Yeah, no? yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Eh, buenos días. A mí este, solo voy a comentar un poco del eh, Martín de los Ceros, este, profesor investigador Flaxo México. Eh, aquí del grupo, una este, entre los cinco compañeros, y surgió algo que mm, me llevó a unas conclusiones. Era acerca tres realidades diferentes, Finlandia, España y América, digamos, Latina. Eh, ¿Cuáles son los encuentros este, informales que se va dando en cada uno de estos países? En Finlandia, el lugar adecuado donde eh, se producen estos encuentros de relajación, para hablar, es el sauna. España mencionaban la comida y en América Latina es normalmente la cantina. ¿Sí? Entonces, eh, bueno, no sé si las compañeras argentinas por ahí me desmienten, pero... Son esos espacios donde se produce, digamos, estos encuentros informales, un poco de hablar de los problemas y eh, de alguna manera hacer la conversación, hacer este, un poco este, que sirva para el mundo empresarial, si estás en la organización o si estás en la universidad, cómo resuelven problemas ante determinados, este, cómo se resuelve un problema de, tomando diferentes este, acciones o diferentes estrategias que se hizo. ¿no? Entonces, esto me, me gustó mucho, la interacción con estas este, dos realidades diferentes a la que yo venía trayendo. Es interesante esta cosa de los lugares diferentes y las culturas diferentes que tienen diferentes espacios. Una de las cosas que vi muy recientemente, que me encantó, porque tal vez en algunos países lo naturalmente hacen. I did a knowledge cafe, one of my open knowledge cafes in London, I think last, uh, last August, and it was an architectural consultancy um, in London. And they had refurbished an old building. In the reception, they had built a bar. And the bar was only open on Thursdays and Friday evenings, <coughs> and the senior directors of the company served behind the bar and it was free. <laughs> and I just thought that was a wonderful way of bringing people together informally to have conversations. I'm not so sure there are too many organizations that would go that far. I mean, I guess maybe in Finland you could have a, <laughs> an organizational sauna. Or... But I think this is a lot of it, is, is thinking about how you can build conversation informally you know, into, into the organization. Um, I know the British Dental Association in London um, tried to do some cafes and they couldn't get people along. So they turned them into charity coffee mornings. And people came along, they paid a little bit for some coffee and a croissant. Um, and the money went to charity, but they also had the interesting conversations around the business that, that you were just talking about. Yeah. More thoughts? Eh, yo. Mi nombre es Celeste Soto, soy chilena y también soy profesora. Entonces, mi pregunta es, ¿cómo en contextos un poquito más formales donde donde tenemos una planificación un poquito más estricta, un tiempo que cumplir, podemos aplicar, eh, podemos aplicar este um, o trabajar esta conversación uh, cuando a veces el tiempo lo tenemos un poco más limitado. Eso. I, I, I've, 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 I've heard the question. I, I suspect without knowing more of your context and how you work and your day, it's rather difficult for me maybe to um, address that question. I mean, I think a lot of the time in you know, business organizations where they have that same problem um, and doing things out of hours, like the charity coffee morning or you know, the American tradition 
of the brown bag lunch, where people come together at lunchtime with their, with their sandwich in their brown bags. I, I know that probably wouldn't work in, in your Spanish culture. Um, uh, or again, the example I just gave of the, of the bar after work. Um, you know, you know is, is there time you know, in your organization, you know, sort of the, the time that's not normally, the time that's normally given over to, to eating or the time that's usually given over to socialization w where you could make some of that time available for informal conversation? I don't know, you know, only, only you could answer. Only you could answer that. But it is a, a general problem. Um, whenever I talk about the cafe to businesses, one of the big problems that comes up all the time is but, you know, but we don't have time, and the managers in our organization don't appreciate the importance of conversation. They won't give us the time. They won't make the time. They see it as just idle chit-chat. You know, get back to your desk. Get back to your work. Um, and you know, everyone's got to figure out how to address that you know, in their own context you know, with the people that they're, that they're working with. There's, 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 no simple, there's no simple solution to, uh, to that problem. En primer lugar, quiero agradecerle su exposición, que me ha parecido muy interesante. Y sobre todo, ha conseguido transmitir muy bien la idea que quería expresar mediante esta fórmula que ha ensayado con nosotros, que es lo de lo que ya se supone que tiene bastante experiencia. Eh, yo quería hacerle do, dos preguntas. ¿no? Una de ellas tiene que ver con que, desde mi punto de vista, buena parte de lo que se ha dicho tiene que ver con lo que yo he podido leer en la literatura sobre dinámica de grupos, donde... ¿Sí? ¿No se oye? Perdón, ¿eh? La pregunta es si eh, la, la, en la literatura sobre dinámica de grupos eh, yo he podido encontrar buena parte de las cuestiones que aquí se han planteado y si realmente usted considera que esto es así y hay ahí eh, fuentes para enriquecer todo este mensaje. Y luego la segunda cuestión tiene que ver con las propias organizaciones. En la medida en que, yo creo que sobre todo en España, hay en, en las organizaciones eh, están muy jerarquizadas y los encuentros informales se producen eh, de manera desigual. Es decir, no hay, me parece que hay pocos encuentros informales donde están los jefes y los propios subordinados en un mismo encuentro, sino que más bien los encuentros informales se producen por separado, los jefes se reúnen en este café, por así decirlo, y los subordinados en otro. Y eh, pregunto si eh, las organizaciones actualmente, sobre todo si son avanzadas, están avanzando en esta dirección de... Eh, diríamos eh, socializar los encuentros informales entre todos los trabajadores y qué efectos está teniendo esto en la propia organización. Muchas gracias. Okay. I mean, there were two questions there. I think the first was sort of about bibliography and, and research into sort of conversational dynamics. Um, I must admit, you know, I'm not an academic and I'm very much a sort of a pragmatist. So, so much of what I've done with the cafe. Um, has come really just out of my desire to do something. I haven't done a whole load of personal research or reading uh, around, um, uh, around group dynamics, to be, uh, to be honest. But, there's a, but there's, a great deal, there's a great deal out there, and it's something that I'm sort of personally trying to, uh, uh, trying to catch up on and, and understand better. Because I say, for me, the cafe simply started out with my frustration from death by PowerPoint presentations and wanting to do something a little different. So I, I, I'm not too sure I can address that uh, question particularly. The second one about the hierarchy, again, it's a similar sort of issue to the earlier one um, around making time. You know, there are so many barriers in organizations to conversations, lack of time, people that don't see the value. Hi you know, certainly hierarchies um, where senior managers see it beneath them to talk at lower levels, or if you're trying to um, encourage a conversation where there are senior managers in the room, 
you know, it will kill the conversation stone dead. Um, and s you're saying, you know, here in Spain, you, you've got a hierarchical culture. I see it very, very strongly um, in Southeast Asia. Um, I've been in conf I was in a conference once, a two-day conference. The, the first day, there were two, two young people in the room, man and the woman. They didn't speak. They didn't engage for the whole day. They sat at the back of the room. They did not say a word. The following day, they were up. They were interacting. They were networking. They were laughing. They were joking. They were, they were two different people. And I pointed out to somebody, and they said, oh, yes, they said, their big boss was here yesterday. He was, he was the, he was the um, senior director of the company. And so they just, they hunkered down. Now, again, I, I don't have a simple solution for how you kind of solve that over, overnight, especially when it's very, very deep in the culture, especially the Asian culture, sort of, this um, respect for parents, respect for elders, respect for you know your seniors um, that runs so deep it's very difficult for them to actually uh, shake it off. And I think again you've got to look at your own context and your own organisation and and find ways of getting around it. You know if you're going to try to run a cafe, say in Asian culture or maybe even even in your culture at times, you've got to make sure that certain people are not in the room. It seems a bit controlling, but if that's what you need to do, that's what you need to do. Um, I also think in getting managers to understand the value of conversation, one of the great places to start would be getting them to take part in some cafes so they can start to see the value of it. And then maybe they would be a little bit more inclined to encourage and support uh, you know, similar sorts of conversational, uh, you know, cafes or whatever, lower down in the organisation. But it's it's more like sort of fighting a, a guerrilla war than it is um, doing anything in a planned, organised, sort of structured sort of way. Okay. I think we've probably got time for one last question or not? Time yeah. for, for the, keep the conversation. Okay. Excellent. So I will, I will stop there and we can carry on the conversation over coffee. So <laughs> thank you.